sip. A lecture series sponsored by the Jonathan Edwards Center, and this year, more importantly, the Henry Center as well, with help from the Templeton Foundation. We're glad that you're here. We hope you found a coffee or a water and you're relaxed and ready for a great lecture. Hope you're ready for some good conversation as well after the lecture. In just a minute, I'll introduce today's speaker, Dr. Reiner Smolinski. And then after I do, he'll come and give his talk. But when he's done, I'll come back and try to field some Q&A with all of you and with Dr. Smolinski. So we can be in here till about 2.30. And if you can stick around until 2.30, at that point, we'll give you a few minutes to meet Dr. Smolinski personally, if you've not done so yet. But then by 3 o'clock, we need to have him at his next gig uh, in the Lee building where he's going to speak to the PhD students. So thank you very much for being here. Reiner Smolinski is professor of English at Georgia State University in Atlanta. He's particularly interested in non-canonical documents in early American religious literature, history, and culture. Since 1984, he's been working on the Mather family papers, Puritan historiography, and hermeneutics. Professor Smolinski's The Threefold Paradise of Cotton Mather, University of Georgia Press, 1995, examines Mather's eschatological ideology in light of his hermeneutical response to the 17th century philological and historical contextual challenges of the Bible as text by Hugo Grotius, Thomas Hobbes, Baruch Spinoza, William Whiston, Isaac Newton, and others. The book includes a critical edition of Mather's unpublished manuscript, Triparadesis, written from 1720 to 1727. Among Professor Smolinski's ongoing projects is a study of biblical hermeneutics in 17th and 18th century England and North America. He's the general editor of Cotton Mather's Biblia Americana, Colonial America's first commentary on all the books of the Bible. A massive holograph manuscript, holograph means wrote it with his own hand, manuscript of more than 4,500 pages in folio, Biblia Americana is in the process of being edited in a 10-volume critical edition, published by Moore Zeebeck in Tübingen. Biblia Americana is the centerpiece of the Mather Project, an online database of the published and unpublished works of the Mather dynasty, including Richard, Increase, Cotton, and Samuel Mather. was quite a dynasty that is currently under construction. Professor Smolinski is the director of two faculty and student exchange programs with Johannes Gutenberg Universität in Mainz and Eberhard Karls Universität in Tübingen and co-director of the Tri-National Summer Seminar convening in Mainz, Atlanta, and Beijing, China. So it is a personal delight for me to welcome Dr. Smolinski to our campus. Would you please join me in welcoming him to our lecture? Ladies and gentlemen, this is a real pleasure for me to be here. As I said to uh, Doug and Joe and others, um, teaching in an English department, uh, uh, the sort of interest that I have uh, makes me always rather apologetic about what I'm doing because it's not the sort of traditional thing that English departments deal with. And coming here, I don't have to apologize or to contextualize. I can just be. And that's, that's a, a great experience for me. Uh, the warmth, the personableness, the family atmosphere um, is very unique, and I really do appreciate that. What I'm talking about today um, is, in some respects, rather obtruse. It shows my own interests. Um, I do my research in early American, especially the sort of um, you know biblical material, but I teach none of that. What I teach is literature from the Puritan experience to uh, basically the middle of the 20th century. So doing research on the one hand versus teaching something completely different is sort of like a split personality having to be at home in different disciplines 
and yet uh, being master of none in, in some respects. And um, it humbles me too to address a theologically centered audience. Uh, why? Because uh, everything I've ever learned about uh, the history of the Bible and uh, the research I'm doing, I learned from none less than Cotton Mather. Uh, whether he's the best teacher to have had, I would certainly like to say that, simply because he's the only teacher I had. Uh, so, uh, um, you know, we of course think of Mather as that witch doctor and Salem witchcraft kind of person. And if you're into cable TV, you probably know about Salem now being in its fourth, uh, no, third season. And the Cotton Mather there is as much at home in hanging witches. They did not burn witches, by the way, they hanged witches, as he is in the pursuit of an alternate reality in the back bay where houses of prostitution uh, are very much a part of that particular movie, cable TV session. But that's not the historical matter that I have ever learned about. Let me get to my point right away. I have so much material here. And uh, uh, you know how this is. Once you have sweated something out, you can never really fully divorce yourself from, from whatever you have written. And cutting out a paragraph is like cutting a finger off. But uh, this is one of my, my problems. And um, OK. The Queen of Science and the Handmaiden of Theology, Cotton Mather and Jonathan Edwards, and Natural Philosophy and Noah's Flood. Um, handmaiden, indeed, theology was the highest form of knowledge, of uh, a discipline to, to be pursued, and uh, everything else essentially bowed toward theology. And this is how I would like this uh, title to be understood. And yet we are here at a crossroads where the sciences in the uh, natural science kind of philosophy versus theology as a different science, scientia, so to speak, um, was taking place. Uh, like all people of faith who live during a time of tremendous intellectual and religious turmoil, Cotton Mather and Jonathan Edwards lived during the so-called rational enlightenment then cosmological, scientific, and philological changes to their world um, have begun to destabilize the authority of the Bible as the word of God. The Copernican cosmology and, and its heliocentric universe have begun to displace the Ptolemaic geocentrism that had governed the cosmology of Judeo-Christian uh, believers since ancient times. Cartesian mechanism uh, laying the foundation of the modern empirical sciences, question the weight and authority of tradition as proof for all natural and supernatural phenomena in the Bible. The new philological, historical, and contextual criticism of the Bible had begun to undermine the textual accuracy, transmission, and verbal inspiration of the Bible. And, then, and the new theories about the nature of light, gravity, and matter in motion posed tremendous problems to literalist readings of the Mosaic creation account. These new ideas required harmonization with conservative interpretations if theologians of all stripes were to survive this age of revolutionary uncertainty. Thus the predicament of Mather and Edwards was not unlike that of a today's Christian whose faith in God and the inerrancy of the Bible is buffeted from all sides, creationism versus evolution, divine revelation versus human rationalism, verbal inspiration versus philological and historical textual criticism, patriarchal authority versus feminist and liberation theology, moral and ethical standards versus philosophical and moral relativism. Of late, we might even add Fake news versus real news. How is one to decide? Both Cotton Mather and Jonathan Edwards courageously faced these challenges head on and invested much of their intellectual activities in devising ways to reconcile this new threatening knowledge with a reformed tradition and the teachings of the Bible. In the following hour or so, or so. I will single out a number of issues debated at the time, among them the new ways of examining the mosaic hexameron, 
the six days of creation, the dimensions, capacity, and design of Noah's Ark, the universal extent of and source of the Earth's inundation, and the interpretation of fossil evidence from America's from American sites. The debate involved the brightest physical theologians of the time. Physical theologians would be members of the Royal Society of London. They were clergymen, but also scientists at the same time, combining the two forms of knowledge. Men of the cloth like Robert Boyle, Thomas Burnett, Edmund Halley, William Whiston, and Sir Isaac Newton in Europe, and Cotton Mather and Jonathan Edwards as the greatest thinker in English North America before the revolution. Uh, speaking of revolutions, here's a brief representation of the scientific revolution that impacted the 17th century. And uh, I think as moderners, we oftentimes forget what the people in the 17th century dealt with. And this representation uh, does it very nicely. If you look at the geocentric universe here, the Earth is in the very middle. Let me try this one here. This is the Earth, surrounded by water here on the side. And then you have a watery ring, the clouds. Notice there is the, the sphere of fire, uh, the origin of the place where uh, thunder and lightning takes place. Notice the moon is obviously the next planet, if you will, Mercury, Venus. The sun is out here, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. And then we have the firmament. Notice firmament, of course, means something is firm, something is hard, the crystalline sphere. And beyond that crystalline sphere, we see, of course, um, the new celestial constellation and the imperium, the celestial imperium or habitation of God and all the elect. This was the old universe. There was nothing beyond. There was no beyond. This was it. And of course, at the very center of it was the earth with all that went along with it. And here you see sort of a nice representation. I just love this. Look at this. Somebody looking through the atmosphere at the various layers, at the various spheres. And there we see, of course, how close, how narrow, how small in some respects, how comfortable that world was. And I'm always a firm believer in reminding us that we stand on the shoulders of giants. And these giants had something else to fight with, and we have the benefit of their mistakes, or we have the benefit of hindsight. And this is what is nicely represented here, I believe. Um, the disappearance of the finite, closed, hierarchical cosmos involved a dramatic change in the conception of the world. And the old, closed world, the previous image, uh, the hierarchy of value determined the hierarchy and structure of being, rising from the dark, heavy, and imperfect earth to the higher and higher perfection of the stars and the heavenly spheres. By the way, this is a quotation from Coiré, uh, the famous French historian. Uh, the celestial imperium and habitation of God and his elect in a closed, limited universe. This old conception was, was replaced by an indefinite and infinite universe bound together by the eternal laws of cause and effect. A universe in which all components are placed on the same level of being. No hierarchy, no gradation. And if you look at this particular sort of concept here, what happens if indeed God's footstool is the earth uh, for centuries. I mean, after all, if we look up, it's the sun that is turning around us. It's the moon that turns around us. We stand still. What happens to that conception of our importance if suddenly we discover we are merely in the orbit of a much larger, well, star, if you will? Are we suddenly sidelined? Are we not as important as we used to believe we were as the center of the creation? And what, of course, if these stars are no longer lodged, these stars are no longer lodged in a crystalline heart sphere that embraces the whole thing. Uh, and now we have an infinite universe, a void, if you will, that can be terribly frightening. It questions the meaning, the sense of who we are and what we are doing. 
before we can appreciate how Mather and Edwards wrestled with the philosophical and cosmological challenges of the day, we need to remind ourselves just how close the two ministers were in the juncture of the Copernican Revolution when the ancient geocentrism associated with the Greco-Roman mathematician, geographer, and astronomer Claudius Ptolemaeus gave way to the emerging heliocentrism on the right of the Renaissance mathematician astronomer Nicolaus Copernicus, even as the Danish astronomer um, Tycho Brahe, 1546-1601, desperately tried to reconcile the old with the new by developing his curious Tychonic geo-heliocentric hybrid. Notice here. Uh, the idea of somehow displacing the Earth from the center of the universe was just too hard to bear for many individuals. Uh, he still has the Earth at the center, and of course he now knows too that the Sun has a center of sorts as well. Let me use my, my fancy thing here. So uh, the Earth is still at the center and the Moon revolving around it, orbiting around it, but the Sun, notice the other planets all revolve around, orbit around the Sun. So he's accepted that, accepted that Copernican, excuse me, that, yeah, Copernican aspect of the new system. But he desperately must have the Earth at the center. Why? It wasn't just a mathematical thing. It was, after all, we are the crown of God's creation placed at the center. This is the place where Jesus Christ was. It cannot be sidelined by, by the sun, a star. Let me begin in chronological order. Let me begin with Cotton Mather, 1663 to 1728. Um, Doug has given already a survey of the famous Mather family. I don't want to re repeat this here. Richard Mather, one of the founders, he taught in Dorchester, just outside Boston, now part of the suburb. John Cotton, one of the definers of the New England way. Um, Increase Mather, the name fascinated me the first time I came to the United States, and that is in part what got me into this increase, increase and multiply, how can anyone have a name like that? And then of course Cotton Mather himself, that floored me because Cotton I associated not with John Cotton about whom I knew nothing, but with cotton balls and you know, that sort of thing. And that did it, you know. It takes all things for all people here. As everyone knows, he was the scion of the illustrious family of Puritan clergymen, nowadays mostly associated with um, the wonders of the invisible world, his famous defense of the Salem witchcraft trials, which, of course, is so much part of our, um, you know, mythical history. We need gargoyles, if you will on the one hand, because we also need the Jeffersons and the Washingtons as the white busts on the other hand. So we always need a, a devil in order to understand who the good guys are. And this position is unfortunately what was assigned to Cotton Mather. He is also very famous for his Magnalia Christi Americana, the church history of New England published in 1702, covering a period not from the beginning of Jesus Christ, but rather from uh, 1620. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, uh, you know, these 70 years still gave him over a thousand pages, folio, if you will. And, of course, his Christian philosopher, his attempt to reconcile Newtonian and European science with the Bible, his medical handbook, The Angel of Bethesda, the first medical handbook written, though never published until 1972, meant to provide individuals far away from any medical doctor uh, with means of curing um, whatever diseases may be coming up. And, of course, most of all, his Biblia Americana, a huge 4,500-folio-sized, uh, double-columned manuscript uh, of over three million words, three million words. He tried to get it published during his lifetime, but no Boston uh, publisher could take it on. They were just too small. Uh, even the London publishers uh, were indeed wary of accepting a commentary from some nobody from nowhere, New England, Massachusetts, and Cotton Mather complains about the sort of colonialism that seems to be be clouding the minds of uh, Europeans. I'm pleased to announce that four of the ten edited volumes 
have appeared in print since 2010. I think I have an image here. Oh, there it is. Um, when all things are said and done, and hopefully by 2021, the 10 volume collection will consist of more than 12,000 printed pages. Well, I was told by a good meaning, well meaning friend that very few writers or editors of commentaries ever saw the end of their project. Either they were elevated prematurely or downgraded, I don't know, <laughs> whatever. But I'm open to anything, if you get my meaning. Compiled between 1693 and 1728, I said it has over three million words in a handwriting that is rather legible. It's a bit blurred, is it not? Uh, from your perspectives, but uh, it's not as bad as the Renaissance, Jacobean, or Elizabethan handwriting. This is relative, and I'm an expert. I'm, I'm getting phone calls from everywhere. What does that mean? And can you imagine how much I can charge for this? Well, <laughs> now I always do that uh, gratuitously. Um, Mather's commentary on the book of Genesis, uh, my focus here. In his commentary on the Mosaic creation, account. Mather, like Jonathan Edwards after him, cites creation myths from Chaldea, Egypt, Greece, Rome, and in the same space as typological and mystical readings from the Talmud, Targums, the early Christian, the early church fathers, and Renaissance and Reformation commentators. Unlike Edwards, Mather incorporates up-to-date pre-Notonian and Notonian explanations from such contemporaries as Lord Chief Justice Sir Matthew Hale, from conservative and latitudinarian divines such as Robert Fleming, Pierre Girieu, Thomas Pyle, and from physical theologians and natural philosophers such as Robert Hooke, Edmund Dickinson, Nehemiah Grew, Richard Bentley, William Weston, and Sir Isaac himself. By the way, I brought copies of the, some of these works by these authors along. If you want to come to this seminar, you can see what the real McCoy looked like. These are facsimiles, mind you. Uh, over a period of more than 30 years, Mather gathered uh, serviceable excerpts from their writings and incorporated them in his Biblia Americana, much like John, what Jonathan Edwards would do a generation later in his blank Bible notes on scriptures and his marvelous Miscellanies. When compared with Edwards's commentary on the Mosaic creation account, Mather and Edwards drink from much of the same fountainheads, the Herozoicon Animalibus uh, and his compendium, the Geographia Sacra, by the French Reformed theologian Samuel Bouhard, one of the greatest 17th century scholars of the Bible. Nowadays you can download it from Google Books. When I started this, I had to look for an original copy, and I found one. I'm still paying for it. I had to get a loan on my house, you know, and uh, uh, equity. Number two, uh, The Court of the Gentiles by the English nonconformist, the Ophelia's Gale, and the standard compendium of the Bible, the Synopsis Criticorum, in five volumes by the English nonconformist theologian Matthew Poole, also famous for his own um, commentary for families. Um, the similarity is not surprising. These famous authors and their works were standard tools on the bookshelves of every scholar theologian who could afford them. Um, you know, some people more than others. Mather was very uh, fortunate in that he was right at the source of Cambridge, Harvard. Um, Jonathan Edwards had a harder time to get a hold of some of these works. Uh, this is where this similarity ends in many respects between Edwards and Mather. If you look at these three sources they all dealt with. Hmm, did I move this already? Okay, here we go. Uh, Mather's scientific commentary, especially on Genesis 1 through 3 and 6 through 8 in the Biblia Americana, demarcate the periphery of legitimacy, he allows his commentators to probe from the center of conventional interpretations. Now, I should 
have put this in more comfortable English, didn't I? What he means, what I'm trying to say is, you know, he was trying to make scholarly information available to a non-scholarly audience. Why not say so? That's what I always tell my students, you know, that you want to sound bombastic and learned, right? The range of authors he included is as revealing as his critique of their theories. During his lifetime, the biblical creation story was experiencing unprecedented challenges with peripatetics pitting their theory of the eternity of the universe, pre-existing matter, against those of conservative physical theologians who insisted that God had created the universe out of nothing, ex nihilo. Right? Such a powerful God, he can do things out of nothing. All the other gods had to have pre-existing matter. And they were co-existent with that pre-existing matter. Well, uh, with Copernican heliocentrism replacing the ancient Ptolemaic uh, geocentric cosmogonies, and with Cartesian mechanism and the immutable laws of nature contesting the venerable miracles and providentialist views of conventional liberalists, literalists, the sudden explosion of knowledge and the formation of new fields of inquiry, physics, chemistry, botany, geology, challenged time-honored biblical exegesis and demanded the attention of the brightest and the best. This is the, the juncture of where Mather and Edwards essentially take off. Um, imagine we found a different, another civilization out there, way, way out in the, in the Milky Way. How would we respond if we had positive proof of life forms, intelligent life forms? in outer space. Wouldn't that change our perspective? Would Jesus Christ, who died for mankind down here, did he die for the people out there too? Or would they have their own Jesus Christ? Imagine the questions that would have to come up. I directed a master's thesis on precisely that topic, and that's why I mentioned this. All right. For instance, Mather's first extract concerning the creation is from Thomas Pyle, an Anglican clergyman of Salisbury, who announces in his preface, quote, I have had all just regard to those modern discoveries and vast improvements in fizzy, philosophical knowledge, yet I have endeavored so to express every circumstance as not directly and explicitly to clash with any one particular hypothesis or opinion. So in other words, do I include this new information that challenges into my Bible commentary, the, the thing that people read, or should I leave it out? I mean, that's a definite choice. Right? Pyle's distinctly Newtonian bent never seriously compromises conservative exegesis of the Mosaic creation story. His determination to keep the battle of the books out of his commentary appeals to Mather. With Pyle's extract at his elbow, Mather predictably rejects the ancient's peripatetic heresy of a universe that was not created by God, but was self-existent frowns upon the necessitarian philosophers as Thales and Cicero, who, while conceding that an efficient cause had formed the universe, asserted that it was formed from pre-existing and eternal matter, and decried the modern Cartesian disciples of Democritus and Ep Epicurus, who insisted that an infinite number of imperishable atoms coalesced through blind chance or imminent mechanical laws to form countless worlds in a vacuum of immeasurable proportion. Are we an accident of blind atoms that coalesced, or do we have design? Is there purpose behind it? Mather insists, and Jonathan Edwards would have agreed, the world did not exist from all eternity by necessity of nature, nor did it or any part of it come into being by chance and fortune, but all things, whatever, whether visible or invisible, material or immaterial, were the beginning created by the power of that infinitely wise, good, and all-sufficient being whom we call God. You know, having thus put down the law essentially, he then can move beyond that. It's sort of like confessing your faith in one aspect or other, and then you can go ahead and criticize it, you know, just to make sure everyone is on your side. The harmony between science and religion so carefully controlled 
in this excerpt foreshadows uh, much of what Mather and Edwards would do in their own works. With a familiar story uh, firmly in place, Mather felt reassured to tackle the controversial new theory of the earth by William Weston. Uh, we see it on the right-hand side here. From its original to the consummation of all things, um, published in 1696 by the Anglican polymath William Weston, Isaac Newton's fellow Arian and successor to the Lucasian chair of mathematics at Cambridge. Wouldn't you know that even Sir Isaac Newton himself, whom we oftentimes invoke as the scientist who confirms, you know, um, the divine plan, himself was an Arian. Uh, and you know, of course, what that means. He did not believe in the Trinity. He believed it was a forgery perpetrated in the fourth century by Saint Athanasius. And Isaac Newton uh, kept his mouth shut for good reason. William Whiston, his disciples, opened it. And what happened to him? He almost lost his head in a, in a material sense. He was dismissed from his mathematics chair and, of course, expelled from the church. And, um, well, that, those were the consequences you paid for telling the truth. Um, this particular book by, New, by uh, Whiston was spawned by uh, a book by Thomas Burnett, Telluris Theoria Sacra, or The Sacred Theory of the Earth. This was a book that changed much, and virtually anyone who wrote on the situation of the creation and Noah's flood, where does the water come from? What did the pre, the antediluvian world look like? They turn to Thomas Burnett. Uh, Thomas Burnett, uh, let me see whether I have the, yes, Thomas Burnett translated into English. It was endorsed by King James II, and it was all the rage translated into many languages. Mather had repeatedly mocked Burnett's thesis that the Earth's surface was, in their day, the mere ruins of the antediluvian crust that had collapsed in upon the in upon um, the vast subterranean caverns filled with the ocean's waters. If this Burnettian romance could be drowned in ridicule, Whiston's new theory was not so easily dismissed. Learned men, Mather says, of late used several essays, all not with equal success, to rescue the inspired writings of Moses from the hardships that have been put upon them. Uh, you must not expect that I declare myself how far I, Cotton Mather, uh, concur with every point that shall be offered, and I will also leave it to you to the same liberty that I have taken myself. What does that mean? I put it here. I won't tell you whether I agree with it, but this, it's out there, and you do something with it, if you will. And uh, so the antediluvian world, as I will explain a little later, uh, is what it looked like here, according to William Weston. Whiston had postulated, excuse me, uh, Thomas Burnett, Whiston had postulated that the great chaos of the first day, as described by Moses, refers to the creation of our sublunary, sublunary earth alone, which means the six days of creation, you know, what happened on the first, second, third day, and so on, only refers to what happened to the earth and the moon. It does not include the creation of the solar system or of the universe at large. That was excluded. And that's, of course, a, a difficult thing to maintain. The foundation of the universe, uh, Whiston argued, was the product of an antecedent event, one not covered by Moses. In pondering the possibilities, Mather finds some logic in Whiston's position. How could the celestial bodies proceeding from a single center of a huge ball, think of the you know, the, the big bang kind of ball, traverse such immense distances as to have arrive, as to arrive at their vastly remote seats in outer space in so short a time as a few hours of the first day. Mather wonders as he critiques the standard creation story. Are we talking about 24 hours? When did hours and days start? Didn't they start when the Earth started to turn around its own axis? Diurnal, 
rotation and then a year by way of turning around the sun, orbiting the sun. When did the sort of time concept start? Hmm, how can the planets of our solar system and the stars of the Milky Way, Mather says, have traveled such a vast distance in such a short time as a single day, even if you believe it was a thousand years long a day? If the centripetal force of universal gravitation, Newton's second law of motion, pulls all moving bodies toward the common center, uh, Newton says, you know, gravitation is essentially embedded in nature, though not inherent uh, in the atom. But gravitation means it pulls itself together into one center, right? It wants to unite into one big ball. How is that possible if the universe was created out of one lump, like the Earth, and then splattered all over the place? Gravitation means it pulls it together. Now, if we had a sen Tripetal, excuse me, centrifugal, a force that pushed atoms apart, if that were regnant, then we could assume there is indeed a universe what we have. But in Newton's system, um, atomism and the gravity pulls things together. There's a contradiction here. Now, if instead of mutual attraction, a mutual repulsion or avoidance were found to be the standing, unchanged law of nature and property of matter, says matter. This might have looked like possible, but when the contrary force of gravitation obtains, and that, as far as we have any means of knowing universally, there is now no room for such an imagination. In fine, this fancy that the heavenly bodies proceed originally from a terrestrial chaos, from that big lung, uh, and cast themselves off from it every way, supposes the earth to be the center of the world or of all that system of bodies and them to be placed in a kind of circumference everywhere about it. But this Ptolemaic system of the world must not hope at this day of time of day to be entertained with considerate men. Here's Mather trying to put it all together and see our universe in a different light and trying to square it with the sequence we have of the lights created on the different days. How does it all fit together? There has to be a harmony between the book of scripture and the book of nature. If God is the author of both of these books, they cannot contradict one another. They have to say the same thing. Suddenly the tidy arrangement of the Mosaic creation account, no doubt pleasing in its poetic simplicity, seems strangely outmoded and inadequate when examined within the context of new theories. Though sacrosanct among the faithful for millennia, the old Mosaic order strained the credulity of physical theologians like Mather and his peers as they wrestled with a problem of squaring religion and science on one common denominator. What about Jonathan Edwards? No doubt aware of the ongoing debate. Edwards has little to say on this topic. In the early Enlightenment then, the hoary model of the cosmos began to lose force as the new science developed alternative concepts of space and time. I'm skipping here a few things. If this lopsided allocation of activities during the first five days of creation failed to prompt discerning minds to question the perfection of the grand scheme, Mather went on, then God's labors recorded for the sixth day, remember sixth day, the animals are created, and then uh, plant, no, plants were around, then Adam, and then, of course, Eve, right? The things happening on the sixth day are plainly too numerous for so short a space of time and should raise eyebrows. For instance, during the brief period of the sixth day of creation, as related by Moses, God had fashioned Earth's animals, including Adam, had given Adam latitude to exercise his dominion over other animals by naming each species by virtue of its nature, dropped Adam into a deep sleep, which must have lasted more than five minutes says Mather, during which God shaped the protoplast, protoplast rib, actually in the Hebrew it says side really, but that's okay, there's nothing there but ribs, and they try to figure out whether men have one rib less than women, well, 
Last time I checked, I still have them all. Into Eve and healed the womb, then giving the pair time enough to know each other, whatever that means, identify their food and learn God's law, and finally permitted the arch plot, the arch mar plot of Eden to wriggle himself into the couple's confidence and precipitate their fall and expulsion, all that in a single day of 24 hours, according to the, quote, vulgar hypothesis of things. Vulgar here doesn't mean stupid, but it means like the vulgate, the vulgate Bible, the language of the common man, the non-scholars. Now, though God Almighty can do all those things in what proportions of time he pleases, Mather readily conceded, man cannot. He must have time allowed him in proportion to the business that is to be done. But behold here, business enough allotted into the sixth day to require no small part of a year for the dispatch of it. Even if Adam were created in a state of maturity, right? when he gains, and he's mature, he speaks, was it Hebrew, by the way, a somebody that he spoke? Um, and has all the knowledge of the universe. He still has to name each animal, right? And then, you know, Eve has to be made from his rib. And of course, Eve needs to be taught as well. And, you know, God can think, can do things at the spur of the moment, but a human being needs to learn. Was he created as a child who has to grow up and learn? Or was he created a, an adult? with all the knowledge. That was some of the questions. If you want to square it with science in our own experience, these questions come up. Even if Adam were created in a state of maturity and with full knowledge and understanding of his assigned tasks, their sheer number would encompass a lifetime, not a day. How then can a rational solution be devised if God's creation is constrained by its own physical laws? It is an indecent thing to recur unto pure miracle. Listen to that. Because the acceleration of them into the space of 24 hours violates the laws of motion which were now already stated and fixed in the world. If indeed God, you know, plan these laws of motion, cause and effect, even by his own direction, it takes time for this cause and effect to take place. And for God to offset his own laws would be to, if you will, um, undermine these laws, almost say with maybe Leibniz that um, of all the possible uh, universes God created, uh, he must, of course, have created the most perfect one or else he wouldn't be God. So for God to offset these laws, interrupt them, just makes no sense. If Mather digested, digest of Whiston's new theory is correct, Whiston did not wholly subscribe to Newton's theological voluntarism either, which held that the creator may contravene the course of nature at any time. Although Whiston does not yet confine the omnipotent God or his immutable will to the imminent laws of nature, as Descartes was wont to do, the protoplast, the crown of God's creation is ostensibly subject to the limitations of his own humanity. The abyss of time and the limits of Newtonianism. Quaint yet faintly modern as Whiston's conjecture, which Mather is obviously excerpting into his Biblia Meccana, uh, quaint as it may sound, uh, it created all sorts of problems. Granted, Whiston was not the first physical theologian to take issue with the Bible's uneven distribution of activity during the six creative days, even if those days were as they were for him each a thousand years long. Many of the ancients and medieval church fathers and Protestant reformers disputed the issue as well. And I could give you a whole outline from uh, Augustine to um, um, to Athanasius, to Origen, to Hilary and Aquinas as to whether they said God uh, created the universe in an instant just like that or over a long period. And they were not uh, uniform in their opinion about this either. And uh, this was, of course, the problem. If you can choose between different ways of interpreting the uh, concept of time involved, 
then um, we should not be surprised that even John Calvin and certainly Martin Luther came to different conclusions. Calvin says, well, God can create the universe at the spare of the moment, you know, in a, in a blink of an eye. And Martin Luther agreed, but he felt that probably more time was involved. And here we see, of course, how the scientific way of looking at nature uh, ultimately questioned sort of the standard ideas of what we took for granted. We don't think of how long is the first day or the second day. Uh, but if you want to uh, provide a Cartesian, uh, let's call that uh, an empirical kind of way of looking at these issues, the problem arises, as described here. In Mather's generation, even the great Sir Isaac Newton struggled with this problem, and he came up with a number of very interesting solutions. Um, and he argued, and wisdom seemed to follow him, that the... Uh, the orbiting of the Earth around its own axis did not really take place until the end of the sixth day. And the Earth did not orbit the Sun or whatever planet either, because the Earth stood still and therefore time had not begun as yet. And if time has not begun, then the idea of a 24-hour day or a thousand-year period for every day is really null and void. If time does not exist yet, then uh, God have spent, could have spent any amount of time prior to the orbiting of the sun, uh, the, the earth around the sun, and vice versa, for creating, indeed, um, what the Mosaic account is about. Uh, Newton's offers a phenomenological, as you can tell, English is sort of an acquired kind of thing for me, you're probably wondering, what sort of accent is that? Smolinsky? Ah, oh, that sounds Sicilian, Italian maybe, right? Uh, no, no, not really. Uh, German is my first language, you know, and ever so often when I'm getting pressed for time, I'm, you know, the old habits are coming through. What can I say? You know, I'm just a human being. Okay, so um, what Newton uh, and then Burnett, Burnett was his old, was Newton's old math teacher in Cambridge, uh, they were indeed debating this sort of thing, and Newton said, well, on the fourth day, when God created the great light, meaning the sun and the moon, the light for the day and the light for the night, um, they weren't created on those days at all, but they had been long in existence before that creation described in 1, 2, and 3 took place. The only difference is, and this is where Whiston comes in and Newton, is that since the Earth had sort of a hazy, foggy kind of atmosphere, it was on the fourth day that the sun and the moon could be seen for the first time. So the creation of the sun and the moon was not a physical substantiation. That had taken place long time ago. It was visible now on the fourth day to someone who existing on the earth at that time would have been able to see the sun and moon. So what we have here is sort of a reinterpretation of that literal creationism by way of resorting to a roots of sorts. You know, they just became visible and thus came into existence to an observer. And that sort of accommodationism, you know, accommodating the old ideas to the new sciences uh, became a big issue um, and had to be dealt with. Of course, you could ignore it, or indeed you could try to reconcile it with standard interpretations. This then was the state of the debate during the lifetime of Jonathan Edwards and Cotton Mather. A good deal of the discussion took place, obviously in private, and uh, everything would have been just fine had Whiston kept his mouth shut, but he did not. That Jonathan Edwards was familiar with the works of Burnett, Whiston, and Newton, and their peers is well established. A quick search of the online works of Jonathan Edwards at Yale, and a review of uh, Peter Tyson, Tyson's catalog of books demonstrate that Edwards read their works, or if not at first hand, then at second, from excerpts and commentaries published by his contemporaries. Significantly, Edwards was, has little to say 
on any of these issues, primarily, as I will explain later, because as a philosophical occasionalist, Edward subordinates the material laws of nature to the work of redemption. The earth as the stage upon which the divine drama of sin, damnation, and redemption is played out in giant characters. As previously mentioned, Thomas Burnett, and moving to the flood, uh, sacred theory was among the most controversial explanations of the flood in uh, Mather's day to stay within René Descartes' mechanist causality of nature and to account for the massive quantity of water necessary to inundate the entire globe. Um, Burnett had posited, and I'm speaking freely here, um, that the original antediluvian earth was completely smooth. It had no mountains. It had no hills. It was as smooth as an egg, an eggshell shaped almost like it. And all the waters we have today in our oceans were actually vested inside that eggshell. They were inside. Uh, the question is, how do we get enough water to flood the entire Earth? Um, 15 cubits, which is about uh, 30, 45 feet above the highest mountain. Where does all that water come from? And what the, uh, some scholars were arguing, if we uh, collect or estimate all the waters in an annual sort of uh, system rushing into the oceans from all the rivers all over the world, the most water that would be collected would only fill up about half of the waters of the ocean. How they came up with this sort of argument is beyond me, but this is what they discovered. So here comes our Thomas Burnett, who is trying to explain the entire system through a mechanical cause and effect situation. The wa there were enough waters, except where they weren't on the surface, but they were inside the globe. And notice what happened uh, when God essentially launched the flood. Um, the pillars of the earth on the inside were washed away, and so that the outer shell, the earth, was uh, cracking by the heat of the sun and was collapsing inside the earth and, and falling essentially into the watery abyss. So that if you look at the next one, we have uh, the old earth completely smooth. Now the exter exterior um, surface collapsing. Notice how the continents are forming here, and what are our today's continents and islands are nothing else but the ruins of the antediluvian earth. So the mountains did not come about through tectonic plate shift, that's the idea of a later time period, but the, the, the mountains and the islands of the sea and the continents are the remains of the original antediluvian, perfectly smooth surface, now collapsed into the interior, and we have indeed uh, this sort of thing. Here our continents are the ruins of the earth. It's very interesting if you look at how nature was viewed and mountains were viewed in the Renaissance. They were deemed threatening, terrible, disgusting even, because there was no order in there. They were disruptive. This was a ruined earth. You could see God's cursing the earth right there in the rough of the surface. Um, there were all sorts of ways of explaining this, obviously. We know, of course, that even our famous Mr. Halley, Edmund Halley, and uh, named, whose name was given to the famous comet, even Edmund Halley tried to explain that there was enough water, but if there was enough water, where is it today? Uh, what happened? Um, we don't want to be miraculous about our explanation. There has to be a natural explanation for it. So here, Edmund Halley says, okay, there was a comet, right? The one that, you know, comets were, comets were suddenly no longer the darts of God, right? But we discovered, he discovered, a regularity of the reappearance of these comets. So they're orbiting in some respects, and that was a relatively new invention or thought, I should say. So what our, um, uh, what our um, Edmund Halley argues then, and this is what Whiston takes up a little later, 
is the following, that the waters necessary to flood the entire earth, including its mountains, if they existed, rejecting Burnett's argument, uh, came indeed to the earth from a comet. And comets, of course, had tails. And it was believed these tails were watery or icy. And as this, um, here's the earth, as you can see, this is the earth right here. And here's that giant comet with its tail full of water as it was coming close to the surface of the, and the, uh, uh, the uh, orbit of the Earth, it dumped all of its water from its watery tail onto the Earth, and this is what caused Noah's flood. Right? Enough water. Um, I'm simplifying things. Oops. Yeah, we uh, we got a rush, don't we? All right. Um, okay. So, um, Wiston was more or less doing the same thing. I'm trying to catch your attention. Uh, let's look at this one here. Um, by Wiston arguing the following. Okay, I'll take um, Halley's argument. Uh, water from a tail of a comet dumped its uh, water on the surface of the Earth. Now, what about the great conflagration, the dissolution of the Earth, Second Peter 3? Well, guess what? Another comet, a fiery one this time, is going to come by the Earth's surface and will burn it all up. Uh, it makes perfectly sense in a mechanist system that uh, runs on the basis of cause and effect. All right. Um, hmm. So, um, let me... There were a few others, like uh, Robert Sinclair, who's... Uh, idea uh, was somewhat different. He said, well, uh, most of the water was not subterranean and it did not necessarily come from uh, an outer space comet and a watery tail, but rather the water was lodged in the sides of mountains in caverns. And uh, I think we have an image of this here a little bit. And have a look. Uh, there it is. If, uh, this is um, uh, Athanasius Kircher, who is also looking for the amount of water necessary to um, uh, flood the entire Earth. Um, so he was arguing that uh, since rivers generally spring from higher elevations, the water has to come from somewhere. So he believed that there are caverns in the Earth that collect this water, uh, and there's a connection to underground lakes as well. So what was happening then is the water was there all along. God just opened these caverns and the water was coming out of all the places where they were stored in caverns and were thus inundating the entire earth. Uh, many theories were floated, quite literally, one of which, of course, was also that maybe the, earth, the, the Noah's flood was not universal at all but it was uh, essentially confined to the old world, for after all, uh, where did Noah live? Where did Abraham live? They lived in a part of the world, and to them Palestine or Mesopotamia was all the world there is. Remember when Jesus um, and his parents are going to Bethlehem to be counted? What was it they were supposed to do? Because um, Caesar determined that all the world be counted. What does all the world mean? China? Alaska? America? No, no, no. This was just all the world of the Roman Empire. And so some argued, well, there was no need for a universal flood because no one lived in America. It was empty. So it could easily be confined to this um, um, a space in the old world. Um, let me move on to something else. Now, how can we prove that there is indeed a universal flood? What evidence do we have? Obviously, Mather was very much interested in the stories from Native Americans. And um, lo and behold, various bones were discovered. Bones of a gigantic size for which there were no explanation. 
And uh, there has to be an account for it. The Bible does not speak of dinosaurs, nor does the Bible uh, mention uh, such things as um, a giant, um, let's call them elephants uh, or whales, uh, of the sort that we are familiar with. So uh, the only story that we can turn to is indeed in Genesis 4, where the angels of man materialized with God, with with the uh, excuse me, the angels of God uh, materialized and had offspring with uh, the daughters of man, and this is where the Nephilim or the giants came uh, came into play. And uh, wouldn't you know, they discovered um, bones in Claverack, upstate New York, giant bones. Molars of the size that we discover here. Uh, they had expeditions, as in the famous exhumation of the Mastodon. Uh, they didn't quite know what to do with these bones. They were too large for an elephant. Uh, they knew what elephants looked like. Uh, whales were too far away. The Atlantic was too far away from upstate New York, Claverack. So they had to be accounted for somehow. And the Nephilim, the giants, seemed to be the best way of looking at it. Of course, what we discovered subsequently, not until the 1800s, is that the bones they found, including the molars, were those of a mastodon. A mastodon is sort of an oversized elephant, if that can be. Uh, accepted as an explanation. And if you look at this particular depiction, notice they had no idea of how to place the tusks, right? They put them together and they thought, well, if there was a mastodon, this is what it looks like. The term dinosaur was not really invented or, or formulated until the 1820s, right? I mean, dinosaur bones have been found all along, but what do you do with those bones? How do you explain them? These must be the bones of the gods. And the ancient Greeks and Romans undug these bones and placed them inside their city walls. These became the totem gods of their city, Athena, Athens, and so on. Right? So, um, well, so what do we do? And this is indeed what they encountered, and uh, this is what they did. Um, more specifically, I'm summarizing quickly. Um, how else can we prove that there was a universal flood than to look for bones way back in the interior of the country? And uh, if these are the Neph Nephilim bones, then surely the flood must have included America as well. Here comes a Danishman by the name of uh, Steno, and he discovered all sorts of shark teeth on tops of mountains. We, of course, know how the remnants of marine life get to the tops of mountains today. We argue for tectonic plate shifts, right? What was at the bottom of the sea is now pushed upwards so that the mountains, the Andes, the Rocky Mountains, and so on, are now really could have been the bottom of the ocean. And this is why uh, marine bones, remnants of marine life could be found, including, of course, the various layers as such. Now, this is our modern understanding, but um, in Mather's time and Edward's time, they were indeed interpreting these fossils in quite a different way, and to them, finding fishbone and uh, shark teeth on top of mountains was clear evidence that indeed um, the uh, universal flood had covered the earth um, in this particular fashion. Having said all of the above by way of prolegomena, by way of introduction, where then does Jonathan Edwards fit the debate? How does Edwards address the question of the Mosaic creation account, Noah's cataclysmic flood, and the water that inundated the earth? Being a relative newcomer to Edwards, myself, I was rather surprised about what I found or should I say, what I did not find. Unlike Mather and his peers, who were quite comfortable with the Copascalarian mechanism, Jonathan Edwards did not want any part of it. 
In fact, Edwards set out to develop an alternative system more in line with his own orthodox view of natural theology. He fully understood how Cartesianism and mechanical laws and its mechanical laws of cause and effect sideline God to the role of a retired machinist watching impassively as his clockwork automaton all by itself ran without interference of God. Mechanism appeared to rule out God's spatial providence. It left no room for miracles or God's divine interpretation. In a way, Edwards created an alternative universe much more in line with his view of an all-powerful creator God whose palpable presence and glory could be seen in the harmony and beauty of nature. His departure from the prevailing philosophy of his day was nothing short of radical. As Edwards put it, in early, uh, put it early on, every atom in the universe is managed by Christ so as to be, uh, to be most to the advantage of a Christian. Every particle of the ear or every ray of the sun is indeed orchestrated by Jesus Christ. Edwards reacted against the materialist philosophy of his day by arguing that physical material objects have no real existence at all. In fact, that, quote, the material universe exists nowhere but in the mind. See what you're missing here? Okay, here we are. There is no such thing as mechanism, he argued in his essay of atoms. If mechanism meant that the bodies act each upon the other purely and properly by themselves, in fact existence itself, and quote, the manner of being and the whole of bodies depends immediately on the divine power of God. Looked at from the vantage point of his contemporaries, Edwards appears to appropriate the scientific language of the day, but turns it on its head. Quote, all bodies whatsoever must of absolute necessity be composed of atoms. No one would have any problems with that. Or bodies that are indiscerpable, a term he steals from uh, Henry Moore, the English Platonist. Uh, or bodies that are indiscerpable, by which he means indivisible, that cannot be made less or whose parts cannot be by any finite power whatsoever, be separated from one another. He had a clear conception, a modern conception, of what atoms were or were not. In fact, it is the, quote, immediate exercise of God's power which keeps the parts of atoms together. Gravity, then, attraction and repulsion, is nothing else but the manifestation of God's activity in matter. Edwards believed in the absolute sovereignty of God in the moral, spiritual, and physical world, for to God, in physical matter itself is nothing but what immediately results from the exercise of divine power. It is God's constant exercise of his in infinite power that preserves bodies in being, for every atom in the universe is managed by Christ. In this manner, then, Edwards redefined the physical world of the watchmaker God as a universe entirely dependent on God's infinite power at every moment through the agency of his atoms. Let me use an analogy. Uh, do you remember the old movie projectors, you know, with a celluloid reel-to-reel -reel kind of thing? And remember, ever so often the machine breaks down and the image gets stuck, right? and you have a person sort of standing like that, so there was an image, and we know, of course, that movement comes about from, uh, from, from frame to frame, right? And only if the frames run in a certain speed do the actors or the agents in the movie move. And if you bear this in mind, you know, frame after frame, this is sort of the analogy that I'm trying to construct here. Like a movie projector running in its celluloid film one frame at a time, better yet for each frame of God's universal movie to exist and to run continuously, frame after frame after frame, and for the movie to run to its de predetermined end, God at every moment uncreates and creates 
a new, out of nothing, one atom or one frame at a time. Else the center will not hold, all matter fall apart and cease to exist. For Edwards then, quote, the universe is created out of nothing at every moment, at every second of the hour of the minute. To certain, Edward, Edwards insisted, that when God first created matter, or the various chaoses of atoms, he designed the figures as well as the shapes of every atom, and likewise their place and function in the material universe. Thus in Edwards' metaphysical system, every atom fulfills its appointed purpose, and God becomes the sole foundation of all natural phenomena. God maintains his absolute sovereignty at every moment, God's omnipotence omnipresence and omnipotence are legible even in the smallest particle of his creation. Did Jonathan Edwards need miracles? Not really, because if God creates and uncreates at every second each atom anew, a philosophy called occasionalism, then at every moment of his creation and uncreation, he could change the course of things, bring about a flood, bring about a catastrophe, save someone, have the sun and the moon stand still so as to give Joshua enough light. Miracles? There were no miracles because God could change things at every moment he created and uncreated things each and every moment. God is not circumscribed by natural laws he himself created. All things in heaven and earth, the whole universe, is wholly subservient to God's divine power and will. God has once or twice interrupted the course of nature, as when the sun stood still in Joshua's time. But that was not a miracle at all. For Edwards, then, nature is not a blind machine, moved by the impersonal forces of impersonal laws, but a special mode of reality in which God's redemptive activity is written in capital letters. In a universe sustained in all of its parts by the will of God and in which operations are connected, uh, which operations are not connected by mechanism, but by the constant exercise of God's conservatory will, as Malebranche argued, even the so-called laws of nature become immediate effects of special grace. That Edwards felt thus drawn to the philosophy of Malebranche does not come as a surprise. So where does that put our Noah's flood then? Would um, Jonathan Edwards have to look for where did the water come from? How much water was necessary? How high were the mountains? Um, you know, this sort of question I didn't really have to be concerned about because God created every atom and uncreated it at every moment so he could change directions, if you will. Nonetheless, he uses this concept of the ark, uh, but yet in a quite different sense. Where does that leave Edwards' interpretation of the causes of the flood? Well, here we have the following, and I'm quoting. There was but one ark that any could resort to for refuge in the whole world, so there's no other name but the name of Christ. The company in Noah's ark was upon many accounts a type of the church of Christ. The ark did literally contain in it the church of God, for true religion and piety seemed to be confined to Noah and his family. The ark was made for the salvation of the church and for saving of the church from the destruction that the world was to undergo by an overflowing del deluge of God's wrath. So the way by which uh, we are saved by Christ, the ark, is by flying from the deluge of God's wrath and taking refuge in Christ as the ark and being in him. The ark was a refuge from storm and from wind, so Christ is, quote, a hiding place from the wind, a cover from the tempest. He that is built on Christ, when the wind blows, the rain descends and floods come and beat upon his house, it will not fail. 
The company in the ark was saved in the greatest catastrophe, when the world was, as it were, dissolved, so they that have Christ for their refuge and strength need not fear. There is Christ, the ark. The ark was taken up from the earth, Noah's ark, and after being long tossed to and fro in the waters, was not steered by the wisdom of Noah, was only under the care of providence, rested on top of an exceeding high mountain, as it were, in heaven, and was brought into a new world. So the church of Christ in this world is tossed to and fro like a bark on the water, passes through great tribulation, and appears to be overwhelmed, but at last, through God's care and mercy, rests in heaven. Well, as we see, what is happening here is, for all of these literalist um, interpretations in a scientific sort of context, as Mather and his peers were trying to reinterpret the um, noetic account, um, Edwards essentially uh, resorts to allegory. He sees the message behind the words, he allegorizes these uh, ancient events, and thus saves them from merely being a story that does not necessarily uh, mesh with our modern understanding of how the universe operates. Huh. To sum up, conservative in their theology, yet welcoming of all manner of new learning, Mather and Edwards, are in some ways more effective in employing the new science as an exe exegetical tool than most of their peers who supplied American pulpits until the revolution. If Mather was fascinated by these new ways of reconciling the word of God with the words of man, John, Jonathan Edwards found his answers in the allegorization and spiritual readings of nature as the history of the work of redemption. For to Edwards, the physical and material reality of nature was less real and less tangible than what it shadowed forth. And what it shadowed forth was the transcendent reality of an all-loving God. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ryan, for a most learned lecture. We've got 10 to 15 minutes for questions and discussion with all of you. And I think Jeff wants to record the Q&A time, so he's working quickly back here with some microphones. I, I as uh, I am used to doing, uh, have developed a couple of starter questions for us. But if you give me body language, I want to make sure we use what little time we have for Q&A for your questions and Dr. Smolinski's answers. So as soon as you're ready uh, to ask a question of him, come up to the microphone. And while the first couple of you are mustering your courage and formulating your questions, maybe I'll begin with this one. Uh, Reiner, you've made reference to Edwards' occasionalism, and you've given us some hints as to how Cotton Mather, by comparison, would have thought about God's agency in relation to the material universe uh, as compared to God's use of secondary causes and laws of nature and so on. Are there places where Mather develops his etiology, his view of causation, in a kind of a systematic way? Is there something interesting to say by way of comparing Mather's understanding of divine efficiency in relation to secondary causes on the one hand, and Edward's more occasionalistic way of talking about these things on the other hand? That's, of course, uh, a good question. Can you hear me even without Mike? Um, I should point out that Cotton Mather is not a philosopher if Jonathan Edwards is a philosopher by the standards of his time. Cotton Mather is a synthesizer, he is a collector, he is a hoarder, he is a pack rat, if you will, of knowledge. He tries to collect as much knowledge as he can and reconcile it, harmonize with existing ideas. He is not a formulator of new ideas while leaving aside the smallpox inoculation kind of thing for a moment. So, um, 
I don't think that uh, Jonathan Edwards and Mather would have understood one another uh, on that issue of occasionalism. Uh, and yet, of course, if I look at Jonathan Edwards and the occasionalist uh, philosophy of, of a Berkeley, of a Malibranche, then uh, this seems to be uh, closer to a Thoreau and an Emerson and their way of looking at nature than it is to the sort of scientific understanding that seems to be current uh, in our days. So, uh, you know, they had the same interest but came essentially in some respects to the same conclusion but with different means. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's how I would see it at least. Thank you. Looks like John Simons has a question. It sounds to me like the um, Edwards passage you quoted on the flood mm -hmm. was more of a sermon than mm -hmm. a treatise. How do you think Mather would have preached on Noah's flood? And would he, preaching to a, a congregation, have mm -hmm. followed a track closer to Edwards than in the Biblia Americana? That's a good point. I should point out that the same allegorical readings that I excerpted from uh, Edwards here can be found in the Biblia Americana just as well. But it is just one of many ways of looking at the old story in new ways. Um, and this is what surprised me. As I said, I am not an Edwardsian by way of background. And I was always looking, especially in the applicable works, for evidence that uh, Edwards sort of would have drawn on Newton and Whiston and Burnett, though the names he drops, uh, yet he does not engage with their ideas. If you look for how he glosses the uh, story of Noah's Ark, it is the standard way of, you know, the... Uh, the, the abyss was open, the abyss was open, and it was raining, and there is no scientific explanation. The same with a creation account. There is no scientific explanation the way Mather was provi providing in his Biblia Americana. And I wondered, why is that case? Why is that the case? How can he just ignore what seems to be uh, a common currency in his time period? And what I then discovered was this occasionalist philosophy that, of course, many people have written about. Um, Norman Fearing is, of course, one of the earliest ones there. And if occasionalism is indeed a way of explaining how God creates and uncreates at every moment, every atom, thus the universe anew, Imagine again, metaphorically, the sort of frame after frame after frame of a celluloid um, reel running on. Then there is no need to speak of miracles or to rationalize them because things can be uh, accommodated at every moment of time. And that is, I think, the, the answer that Edwards seemed to offer to himself. Uh, for him, it was no question. Um, yeah, looks yeah. like a few more questions over mm -hmm. here. I'm Angela Rentis, a uh, biology professor on the college side. <clears throat> so you have to excuse my uh, lack of familiarity with Edwards. You mean your accent there, like mine? <laughs> okay, go ahead. <laughs> um, so I'm going to ask a couple of questions okay. that are pretty straightforward. All right. Or not, there's not much to them. But trying to follow your explanation and description of occasionalism that you associate with Edwards. Mm -hmm. Uh, first of all, my question is, does, does natural law as a concept have meaning for Edwards? Because you said miracles are not something he requires, and by definition, miracles require a concept of regularity and nat right. natural law. Right. So that's my first question. Mm -hmm. And second question is, uh, you emphasized his allegorical use of the Ark and the Flood. Right. Uh, did he still accept the historicity of the ark and the flood, and he simply was looking at the meaning allegorically? I, I wasn't quite sure from what you said whether he, at some deeper level, rejected the historicity of the flood account and was just creating and embracing this allegorical uh, use of the uh, of the flood. Um, this is a, thank you very much for your two-part question. I think uh, Doug would be much more uh, equipped and expert in answering this question. But very briefly, I don't think um, uh, Jonathan Edwards doubted the historicity of Noah's flood. 
or had any question as to how large would the, the, the ark have been? How did the animals, even from America, get over to the old world? And worse yet, how did those nasty species like spiders and creepy crawly and wild things, how did they get back to America, right? That, that was not a question that he concerned himself with. He accepted the account as it was given. And this is what his glosses in the applicable works, notes on scriptures, uh, the uh, interleave blank Bible and the miscellanies seem to be suggesting. And, and, and I think the solution to all of that is indeed the occasionalism that he is addressing. Uh, I think uh, Edwards, if I understand him correctly, did believe in natural laws, laws of cause and effect. But the cause was not the previous cause that pushed the ball a little further down, but it was essentially God, his activity in matter. The, if gravity is something inherent in matter, which Jonathan Edwards would have rejected as a concept, even Newton rejected it, right? then God operates through the operations of natural law, but is not bound by its strictures. Uh, that's the sort of understanding I have. Uh, Doug, what do you... Yeah, well, I, I don't want to take away from our time with oh. Dr. Smolinski. I lecture on these things all the time here, but very quickly, <laughs> Edwards is inconsistent on this, so he, he does use Malebranchian occasionalistic language a lot to talk about God's relationship to the world. But on the other hand, you know, he turns around the rest of the time and talks about laws of nature, secondary causes. Uh, he's an ontological realist. And so one of the big challenges in Edward's studies today is to try to figure out how all that stuff fits together, right. or if, it, if indeed it does fit together. Yeah. Miscellanies number 1263 is the best place to go if you want to follow up. Timothy 175, right? <laughs> if there's such a thing. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Paul Maxwell. I'm a PhD student here. Uh, you made a brief mention to some of the um, political difficulties in Mather's time of making genuine gestures toward the book of nature, um, there were cultural and institutional motivations not to discover things that disconfirmed you know, certain religious ideologies. Right. So um, in what way uh, do these studies prompt contemporary discussion for religious communities today where there are less incentives you know, not to discover things that disconfirm Christianity? You know, how, what, what conversations should religious communities be having Today. Uh, yeah, today. Okay. Uh, from your perspective. Yeah, um, this is, of course, one of the big questions. And uh, historically speaking, we see, of course, how especially higher criticism and the emerging, um, you know, the, the victory of scientific thinking in the 19th century created a, what can be called a split between religion, theology on the one hand, the sort of literalism, historical reading that had truly happened the way it is described, and the scientific explications. Uh, my sense would be that which was offered many a times before, that uh, what the Bible indeed is doing is the following. And here I'm paraphrasing Galileo Galilei, who had problems, of course, of a peculiar type. The Bible is teaching us how to go to heaven, not how heaven goes. What does that mean? The Bible is not a book of physics. The Bible does not try to explain, you know, the Big Bang or the first day and second day or whether there's a flood large enough and what water consists of. Um, that is sort of a story, if you will, and by story I don't mean this in a pejorative sense, that imagine if Moses is a historical person and he's trying to unify a mixed multitude of uh, uh, uneducated individuals. If um, Moses were a physicist of the uh, the Workian, um, you know, sort of variety, would they be able to communicate? If I said the sun is really, you know, uh, the center, it's the Earth that is revolving around the sun. What would the what what the, what does the child what does the child in us say? Wait a minute. Can't you see it? It's the sun that is turning, not the earth, right? So what I'm arguing then is 
I think if we understand that the Bible accommodates its message and its explanation to a common understanding that it teaches us the love of God, not how his creation operates. And if we don't try to hair split by way of looking for roots and whether it means this or whether it means that, when we discover that uh, the three are one, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one. What does that mean? Are one in agreement or one and the same person? Notice there are different ways of looking at this. If we are looking for such explanation that only one or the other can be right, um, then we run into problems. I think if we accommodated ourselves, what is really important? Uh, the 11th commandment. Do unto others as you would have done yourself too. And that says it all. Then, you know, the rest is commentary, if you will. And I'm paraphrasing here some famous people. Then the scientific, I understand this is a book Pentateuch, written by a people who were living in the Stone Ages. Now, not necessarily the cavemen, you know, that we are thinking of, but a Stone Age mentality explaining phenomena, why there are seven days. Well, there were seven planets, there were seven gods, right? Now, all the philosophies of the time said that each of these planets is a separate god, and there was pre-existing matter that the superior god used in order to form the thing the universe. And here comes the Hebrew God. He's so powerful that he can create things out of nothing. And he controls the sun, the moon, and the planets. Right? So if you look at it from that point of view, uh, the scientific debate is not debate at all for me. And I'm with Jonathan Edwards there. What matters? Do unto others. We're out of time, but Dr. Gunlock's been waiting, so we'll give him the last question. Okay. I'm sorry to follow up your sort of spiritual conclusion with such a mundane question, but yeah. it is truly a mundane question because it's about the earth. And I thought I'd ask you a question about Cotton Mather. Okay. So oh, I'm feeling so much more uh, <laughs> on safe ground here. Um, you showed us early on a picture of the kind of Renaissance era, I guess, mm -hmm. um, notion of the structure of the universe with the earth at yes. the center. And you mentioned something went off in here is that putting Earth at the center somehow meant that the Earth was the most important. You didn't say, but we often hear people say that the Copernican Revolution kind of decentered humanity and made us uh, less uh, noble mm -hmm. and important and so forth. And I've heard quite an opposite reading of that, that really, if you think about it, what's at the absolute center of everything? At the center of the Earth is hell. Okay, mm. so it's not that the most important thing is the thing is that, that's at the center. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's way out at the margins that you have the celestial sphere where things are perfect, right? Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, I'm wondering, what did Cotton Mather actually think about that structure? Did he talk about the Earth being at the center meaning something? Uh, well, he said, at this day and age, we can't use the Ptolemaic system anymore, and if you do, you're really not educated anymore. I have not, or not enough. I have never found anything where he says, well, this therefore means we are not as important as we thought we were. So but he does sees this meaning into the, the uh, heliocentric. Uh, well, he embraces system. heliocentrism, but, but he doesn't sees see it as meaning something yeah. spiritual or. Uh, He's, uh, what I see him say is it shows the power okay. of God to have the system run as it does in this fashion. And yet without his intervention, constant interference, if you will, uh, the system would collapse. Um, yeah, he gives it spiritual interpretations, but he has... He does not question whether or not suddenly Jerusalem or Rome is at the center of the earth or whether hell is really hot. Uh, is hell the center of the earth or is it merely a conception of, of a state of being in the mind? He doesn't go that far. Um, not sure whether I fully answered your question, but... No, I think it does. I mean, you know, the, the earlier view sees the structure as actually conveying some meaning. And yes. it seems that the structure is, in a sense, meaningless. No, the structure shows that this is a god of order. 
a god who knows how to arrange things in a hierarchy. From Mather, this sort of um, the pyramid, the social pyramid with God at the top and the smallest insect at the bottom was still very much alive. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all for coming, being such attentive listeners. Thank you very much to Dr. Smolinski to being on our campus today. Should we thank him? <laughs>